with you guys. Let me just say another quick prayer. Lord, we just love you, Jesus, and invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak to us. Come and release revelation to our hearts. Come and give us wisdom and discernment of um, what, what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in this season in the body of Christ. I pray that you would draw us to you in a deeper way, that you would stir up hunger over this next hour in our hearts, more hunger for you, more desire for you, uh, more love for you, um, that you would um, stir up faith in our hearts to uh, to believe that anything's possible. We pray for that childlike faith. Lord, that we were praying for uh, just a few minutes ago, Lord, just faith to believe that anything's possible with you, um, that that there is power in your name, Jesus. And so uh, come Holy Spirit and and use me and, and help me today. And I pray that you would uh, encourage all of us by your word in Jesus name. Amen. Well, um, I want to talk today about fasting with you guys. I know you're you're part of uh Online prayer community, by the way, amazing. Thank you all for being a part of the Global Family Prayer Room. It's it's just an, it's just a really amazing ministry uh, to know that uh, there's 24 seven prayer collaborative across uh, the world. Uh, it's just a, it's just so beautiful and so encouraging whenever I think about it. So thank you all for serving and taking your hours and praying. It's it's uh, so valuable and so important to the Lord. Uh, for this year, I um, really felt like God is wanting to speak, give hope, release vision, uh, stir up clear, prophetic understanding of uh, of what he's wanting to do. And so I, I, I believe if we're willing to press in to him for 2023, I, I think uh, he wants to give us hope. He wants us to help us to see and to hear his voice more clearly. I think he wants to give us dreams, visions, uh, and and really greater insight and clarity about what's on his heart for the future. Uh, and I think part of how we're going to tap into those things that he wants to show us and help us to see for the future is is going to include fasting. And so I, I do believe there's an invitation. Um, I've felt it. I've talked to others who have felt it um, to really to really press in. There's a sense that there's some unique. Uh, prophetic things lining up for 2023. Uh, I know Jonathan and I have even talked about some of those things, especially around the time of Pentecost and the spring feast days this year. And so I just want to encourage you guys as you're praying. Uh, I know I know many of you are probably already fasting or, or that kind of thing, but I want to encourage you in it. And I want to just give some biblical foundations for it. Um, so that we can do it with strength and maybe some consistency and, and fervency this year uh, in a fresh way. So I was I was actually writing a chapter. I, I'm working on my second book right now. And so it's going to be about prayer. It's going to be called tentatively called intimacy and inter intercession. And uh, and so I'm, I've got I think I've got one more chapter left to try to get out this this rough, first rough draft. And but I was working on the chapter on fasting and prayer. And I was remembering uh, this story. The first time I kind of ever did like a somewhat extended fast, I did seven, a, a seven day fast. And we were, we were hosting a gathering in our city. This, I was in my early twenties and we had this worship band and we were, we would travel around and lead worship at youth groups and youth rallies and host revival and worship nights and really just try to like stir up students to just be zealous for Jesus. And, um, we had been traveling around all spring kind of like building up to this event. We were going to host at our, uh, town common here in Greenville. It's like the biggest park in Greenville. And we just wanted to try to rally, you know, a few hundred students to come and have a night of worship and prayer and really like praying for revival and praying for our city together. And uh, leading up to the event, our kind of little team, of our band, and then kind of our team of people that were that were with us, uh, we we're like, let we want to fast and pray for seven days. So we want to pray every night together, and then we want to fast for seven days. And I had never never done that, and honestly, I didn't want to do it on my own. I figured I wouldn't do it, but I said maybe if I'm the leader and I say let's do a seven day fast, it would kind of like lock me in, and I'd have to do it, and uh, and the accountability would help me. So that was, that was first, first seven day fast, but, um, obviously it was hard and uncomfortable and challenging and awesome at the same time. And so we, we were, we were heading towards this 
seventh day. We actually called the event day seven. That was the name of the event we were hosting. And we were build, building towards this day and, and feeling stirred and, and feeling tired and hungry. And, um, and we were looking at the weather forecast and it was like forecasting to rain that night. And so we were like praying that it wouldn't rain. And, um, we, we get there to that, to that day and we've got to unload, you know, sound equipment, and some gear and like set up earlier in the day. And it's like the, the clouds are looming and it's dark and we've got like intercessors walking around the park, like praying, pr trying to pray the rain away. And, um, we're like setting up and it's kind of off and on raining. We're having to cover things with tarps and, and we're trying to figure out what are we going to do? You know, maybe an hour or so before the event was supposed to start the sky above us literally just parted open and you could see the blue sky through the clouds. And for, for our event, there was it, like, literally those clouds all around the edges of the skyline, but right above us was just like an open heaven, you know, <laughs> in, in the sky. And, uh, and we were just like, this is amazing. This is like a Bible level miracle where there's like weather patterns are changing <laughs> as we pray. And, uh, and I was like, so stirred and it kind of like got me hooked on fasting. You know, I was like, is this what happens <laughs> when you start fasting and praying? Uh, this is, this is amazing. And so that was sort of my first foray into, um, any kind of extended fasting. And, uh, and so it doesn't, I don't always see, you know, incredible miracles in the sky <laughs> every time, but you know, that was, I think God just draw me in saying, Hey, look at what can happen when, when people come together and fast and pray, it was just kind of a sign to me, encouraging me. But, um, so, so what is fasting? I, I want to just give a couple introductory thoughts, and then I want to give you five points today from, from the scriptures that I think are, um, are going to help us to have clarity and, and understanding around this. Uh, when, when I say fasting, I, I, I think the Bible understands fasting is not eating. <laughs> so some people say, oh, I'm going to fast from social media or I'm going to, you know, change my diet, have a modified fast. And that, that's great. I, I do think biblically fasting typically means not eating. And so uh, I think that should be, you know, not eating for spiritual purposes. It's not just not eating. But we're we're not eating in order to press into God, in order to seek Him and pursue Him, pursue Him more. And I believe personally that fasting is just one of those neglected keys for awakening our awakening the church, awaken the body of Christ in the West, in America, uh, for keeping our hearts hungry in the midst of prosperity in the midst of luxury and comfort and convenience and all the things that the trappings of this world and the spirit of the age, I think fasting is one of the keys to keep us um, sober, uh, to keep us awake and tuned and hungry and, um, and not, not getting lulled into the uh, lukewarmness and sort of the sluggishness that can happen when we are uh, in a Western context in a prosperous country and, uh, in, in the environment that we're in. And, uh, and I, I think if we could see the church, man, enter into fasting with prayer, oh man, things would really, um, would really open up, uh, in, in, in a powerful way in terms of revival and the kingdom of God, uh, com coming to the earth. So, uh, five points I want to give you, I'll give them to you, um, up front here, and then we'll, we'll dive into each one. So five, five truths from the Bible about fasting. Number one, fasting regularly is normal Christianity. Number two, fasting accesses what Jesus died to give. Number three, fasting expresses and cultivates hunger for Jesus. Number four, fasting increases our faith for ministry and miracles. And number five, fasting is spiritual warfare. So those are the, I, I assume we'll get to all five of these. We'll see. Um, please repeat. Yes, I'm going to go through them so you can, um, you can catch them. I'm going to take some time and go through each one of these. So uh, number one, fasting regularly is normal Christianity. Normal Christianity. So Jesus talked about fasting in Matthew 6. Some of you will be familiar with this, right? It's the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5 through 7 is kingdom 
Christianity 101, right? This is Jesus's foundational teachings, I believe, uh, for those that, that choose to follow him. And he gives these three rebukes really to hypocrites in uh, about three different things. Uh, he says, you know, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. And he says, when you give and, and, and share and uh, are generous and serve, don't be like the hypocrites. Uh, and then the third one he says is when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. And so some have pointed out the fact that Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. So for most Christians, I think they would admit, okay, we should all pray. You know, even if they don't, they're going to say, okay, we should pray. Right. Uh, most of them will say, okay, we should give money. We should be generous. Uh, you know, mo most believers will say that should be a normal thing we do. That should be a regular thing we do. We should, we should pray every day. We should give out of our paychecks every time we get paid. Right. Uh, we should be generous, but what's far less common and far less accepted is the fact that we should fast. But Jesus puts those in the same category, prayer, giving, and fasting to Jesus. Those are, those are the same things. He just assumes these are going to be things that my followers do. He doesn't even tell them to fast. He says, when you fast, and then he gives some instruction on how to do it in a way that's not hypocritical. And uh, obviously in the Western context, uh, in the church in America, fasting is not considered normal Christianity. I mean, a lot of believers have never heard a sermon about fasting, have never fasted uh, at all. And, uh, and, and it's just not a part of, you know, normal evangelicalism uh, here, here in America. But for Jesus, this was kingdom Christianity 101. Uh, we know from history and from the scriptures that the early church fasted two days a week. Uh, this was the Jew typical Jewish practice. Uh, you see that Luke 18. Uh, I know you guys were just praying through Luke 18. So it's in there where it talks about, you know, Jesus rebuked the one who was bragging about fasting two days a week. Um, and so that was the normal Jewish practice. And then the Christians adopted that same practice, except they changed the days. So I don't remember which days it was, but it was something like, you know, the Jews would fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so the Christians would fast Wednesdays and Fridays or, or something like that. Um, once they converted to, to following Jesus, but they would fast two days a week. They adopted that practice. And, uh, and so we have no grid for that. Most of us, uh, the idea that we would not eat a couple of days a week as just a normal part of following Jesus. Um, but fasting regularly is normal Christianity, uh, in the new Testament. Uh, in Acts 13, the church of Antioch, they ministered to the Lord with fasting. Acts 13, 1, 2, 3. You can, you can look at that. And that word ministered to the Lord the, is, is the Greek word there. Uh, and I think it's liturgeo or something like that. I don't know Greek, but uh, it's, it's where we get the word liturgy. And so this was their normal thing. The liturgy is something that they would do repetitively repetitively uh, on a regular basis, right? It was, it was a normal rhythm for them. So they would, uh, they had a, a liturgy of worship, prayer, and fasting as part of the church there uh, at Antioch. And so a lot of, a lot of times we say, oh, we're just going to fast when there's a crisis, you know, Lou Engel calls a fast or, <laughs> you know, there's something big coming up or, or, or you know, we, we kind of uh, use it as a as a uh, reactive thing. Sometimes we're going to react to to something going on as as fasting rather than uh, just having it as a lifestyle, a fasted lifestyle. And I believe Jesus would have us live a fasted lifestyle where we're fasting regularly um, uh, until Jesus returns. You know, uh, there's this quote from A.W. Tozer where he says the fall of man has created a perpetual crisis. So if you're going to fast because there's a crisis, well, <laughs> there's a perpetual crisis and it's called a fallen and broken world that needs Jesus unreached people groups that haven't heard the gospel and a lukewarm church in the, the West that needs awakening and revival. So if we're going to, if we're going to fast in times of crisis, it's going to be until Jesus comes back. That's sort of what uh, A.W. Tozer is getting at. So I want to encourage you uh, if you're not fasting regularly, by regularly, I mean weekly, ideally, I would encourage you to do it. Uh, the easiest way to do that is probably just to, to skip a meal, maybe a lunch once a week. Uh, 
and take that time you would normally eat and um, and pray, read your Bible, and uh, and start there. I uh, you know, and then and then grow from there. I, I would say work towards you know what works well for me is I eat dinner one night and then wait till dinner the next night. So skip breakfast and lunch on that day. And then that gives you a full 24 hours of, of fasting. And uh, I, I think it's, I think most pretty much any believer could work towards doing that on a weekly basis. Um, and I would encourage you, you all to do that. So that's, that's the first point is fasting regularly is normal Christianity. And, and what you're going to experience as you begin to do that is a heightened awareness of the presence of God, uh, an increased hunger for God, uh, potential increase in supernatural activity in your life, revelation from the scripture. And you may not notice it immediately, but uh, as you begin to adopt it as a lifestyle, it's sort of like the water level in your spirit rises up and you just go, oh, like I'm just sort of living in this place of sensitivity to the Lord, of hunger for God that's increasing. Uh, times of worship, you're going to, you're just going to be more aware of the presence of God. So, uh it's, it's awesome. And it's hard <laughs> and you get hungry. And so like, let's be real. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, be, be unrealistic and, and super spiritual here about the glory and the beauty of fasting. There are rewards, but there's, there's challenges. And that's the, the challenge and the hunger is part of the purpose of the, of fasting, you know, the, the uncomfortable feelings and the weakness you feel and the pain you feel in it is actually part of uh, what the, what God uses to um, make us desperate and make us hungry and draw us into him and humble us. So that's, that's all part of the process. So uh, point number two, G fasting acts uh, access is what Jesus died to give fasting access is what Jesus died to give. So there is something we get from fasting. There are rewards and Jesus touched on it. When he talked, when he, when he talked about it in Matthew six, I'm going to read the passage. So this is Matthew 6, 16 through 18. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So there is a reward from the Father. Uh, that we receive from fasting. And Jesus did not mind saying, hey, if you fast, there's going to be rewards. There's going to be benefit to this. And the benefit's not going to be from others. It's going to be from the Father. It's going to be from Him. And I would say the the ultimate reward is God Himself, right? Um, Genesis 15, Abram said, um, or, or God said to Abram that I am your exceedingly great reward. And so um, maybe Jesus was even thinking about that when he's using that language of a reward where he's saying, hey, you're, you're going to you're going to humble yourself, empty yourself through fasting, humility, prayer, repentance. And I'm going to reward you. I'm going to fill you with myself and uh, reveal you're going to be able to um, access more of me. And so it, it's it's I want to I want to be clear here that that we're not earning things but Jesus is fine with saying we do have there are rewards but that's why I say we're accessing what Jesus died to give uh, because we're not earning things in fasting but we are accessing things in fasting right um if if you need to go through a door you've got to turn the handle and you <laughs> and, and you've got to open it in order to walk in. And it doesn't mean you've earned your way in because you turn the handle, but that's just the way that you get in the room is you've got to turn the handle and you've got to push the door. And, um, and so some people think, Oh, well, you don't want to try to strive and earn things. Yes. We're not earning something, um, you know, in, in our own effort. Um, it, we are accessing what Jesus is now offering to us, which is above all intimacy with him and his presence and his in and, uh, and, and more of his uh, joy and life and um, spirit in our lives. So um, it, fasting should be focused on God. Fasting isn't, uh, you know, so like I said, some people just just fast in times of crisis and it's like, 
oh no, we need something from God. So let's fast, <laughs> right? So you fast and pray for, for God to give you something or release something or to heal somebody or to bring revival or, and, and all those things are great, but uh, a fasted lifestyle. And I believe uh, at the heart of fasting, there should be uh, a desire to pursue God himself. It should be an expression of our love for him and uh, a desire to be intimate with him uh, and, ex- and, and an act of worship. The uh, the prophetess Anna in, in Luke 2, you know, it says that she ministered to the Lord with fasting and prayer. That like her fasting was a ministry to God. They did the same thing at Antioch. Um, and so that that's that's a unique way of thinking about it, isn't it? Sometimes we think of fasting in other other ways, but that our fasting is a ministry to God. And it's a way to worship him. It's a way to honor him and to uh and to go to the Father in secret and receive uh the rewards he has for us. So uh, 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 one way I, I, t- I think about this is it's like, you know, Christmas time, we gave our kids gifts, right. And, um, and th- we, we wrapped our, our Christmas gifts for them, of course. And so they have to unwrap the gifts. Uh, and, but their unwrapping of the gifts did not earn them. Right. <laughs> but they have to unwrap them in order to receive them from us. If, if, and so I believe the Lord has things he wants to release in our lives, things he wants to give to us, but we've got to unwrap them. Right. And so the act of unwrapping does not earn them. The act of praying and fasting, we're not, uh, we're not earning uh, anything again uh, from the Lord. Those spiritual disciplines are not us, um, you know, talking God into things and twisting his arm, but um, they're simply his means that he's giving us, he's given us in his word uh, in order to, enter into all that he has for us. So, all right. um, So that's number two, fasting accesses what Jesus died to give. Number one, fasting regularly is normal Christianity. Um, And now number three, fasting expresses and cultivates hunger for Jesus. There's this strange connection between physical hunger and spiritual hunger and fasting. And I, I don't totally understand it, but it's just, it's just the reality is that making ourselves physically hungry uh, stirs in us spiritual hunger. And, uh, and I believe uh, there, there should be a sense in which we're hungry for God in an ongoing way. And I, I would say for a lot of people, that's not their normal reality. And, uh, and I think it's okay Obviously, everybody has seasons and ebbs and flows in their spiritual walk and that kind of thing. But I, I do believe there's an opportunity to sustain hunger for God. Um, and I think fasting is one of, one of the keys um, to sustaining um, hunger for God in, in a more regular way. Um, fasting is unique in that... Um, it makes us hungry, but it also satisfies us at the same time. (laughs) Uh, It it, it awakens hunger in us. It it awakens a desire for God in us. Um, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition and infinite joy Oh, sorry, when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And uh, and, and I love that, that God would awaken uh, desire in us. Um, he, he says he says the Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Um, so, so the key is not to, um, you know, chill out our hunger and our desires, but to awaken our desires and turn it towards the Lord, um, turn our longings and our, and our yearnings, uh, towards him to be satisfied in him. So fasting makes us hungry, but also as we fast, we find ourselves more satisfied in God. So there's this perpetual thing that happens where, uh, we hunger more for God. And the more 
we feast on him, so to speak, uh, the more we receive of his word and are filled with his spirit, then we go, oh, I'm satisfied in you, God, but that just makes me hungry for more, right? And so it's different than uh, it's different than when we eat normal food. So, uh, you know, when we eat food, we, we kind of have this sensation of being full. And uh, when, when we feast on God, we, we sort of have that, but we also have an increased hunger for him. And, uh, and so fasting allows us to enter into both the hunger and the satisfaction at the same time. It's like that song, uh, the more I seek you, the more I find you. But then the second part, the more I find you, the more I want you, right? So it's like the more you see of God, the more you want of God, the more you experience of his love, the more you want to experience his love, the more you see his kingdom being released, the more you want it. And uh, and it's the same way where you kind of get stuck in a rut the other way too, where it's like when you're not hungry, you don't know that you're not hungry and you're not hungry to be hungry anymore. So you kind of have to like kickstart it. And fasting is a great way to kickstart that process of, hunger and satisfaction, uh, in God. And, um, and to quote A.W. Tozer again, to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love, right? So we find we've got God, but we pursue him still. We're satisfied in him. Uh, but, we're, but we're hungry still, right? So there's this tension of fasting where there's a joy and there's a reward and there's a satisfaction, but there's a hunger and a yearning that's also growing um, in our hearts. So Jesus uh, described that, that tension, that hunger as mourning. And so I want to look at Matthew nine, another one of Jesus's teachings on fasting, Matthew nine verses 14 through 15. Says this, then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So Jesus is introducing himself as the bridegroom, and We know from Paul's teaching in Ephesians that we are the bride. The church is the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. And Jesus is uh, there with his disciples. And he's saying, uh, you know, or excuse me, some of of John's disciples. And they say, why are your disciples not fasting? And, and, And his point is, well, I'm with them now. So they're satisfied with my presence. But when I go away, when I ascend into heaven, is what he was saying, in that day they will fast because they'll mourn. They'll they'll long to be with be with me. Um and so Jesus describes that 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 uh, motivation of fasting to be a result of mourning in our hearts. And so that mourning comes from a uh, the disconnect between the reality of the world we live in and the the reality of heaven, right? So the kingdom that's here in a sense, but it's not fully here. And this is what what you guys do as intercessors all the time, uh, as you're praying for others, as you're praying for revival, as you're praying for the world, you are standing in the gap between what is and what is not. You're you're living in the tension between what God wants to do and w- what's happening right now, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, but we're not there yet. And that tension, Jesus describes it as mourning. And it's a it's a longing for Jesus and it's a longing for his kingdom that's awakened in our hearts. And uh, fasting awakens that mourning. And fasting also is a way to express that mourning. So it's both. Uh, again, we express our hunger and we act and we stir up hunger through fasting. So, uh, you know, for many of us, we go, Oh, Jesus, we want you. We want your kingdom. We long for your return. We long for you to come back and fully manifest your presence in your kingdom as you've promised to do. We, we yearn, we long, we miss you, Jesus. So there's that desire for him that causes us to fast. Um, but then also sometimes we go, oh, Jesus, I kind of, I, I don't, I don't have that morning. I don't have that hunger. I don't have that longing. So I'm going to fast 
and pray to awaken that hunger and that desire in me, because that's what you uh, long for is that I would be uh, one with you and, and love what you love and feel what you feel. And, um, and so fasting is a way that we, as the bride of Christ, we can anticipate hasten and prepare for the Lord's return. And, and really that's what Jesus is talking about here. There's a, there's a posture of fasting that's related to us being the bride of Christ longing for, you know, we're betrothed to Jesus, longing for the consummation, longing for the wedding day when Jesus will return and we will be one with him. Right. It's like that. I, I don't know. I, this is just coming to me, but when my wife and I, we, we got engaged in October and we were married by December because <laughs> we were like, let's not drag this thing out. Right. Like if, if we're supposed to be married and we know it, God, God said it, our parents are good with it. Our pastors are, are in agreement with us. Like, let's just go ahead, plan the wedding quickly. And let's, let's go ahead and get married because we didn't want to have a long drawn out time of being an engagement where we're, you know, just like, waiting, 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 longing, longing, longing to be married, but, uh, but not getting to. And so like, we're sort of in that window of time, right? Where we're betrothed to Jesus and we're in this waiting time and we're going, Oh, Jesus, <laughs> we want, we want you, we long for you, uh, for you to return and and for your kingdom to come in fullness and, and for all the promises to be fulfilled and all things to be made new. And, uh, and so we're like in that tension and that tension is the mourning that Jesus describes is that, that hunger, uh, for him. And so we, we hunger for revival now, but we hunger for the ultimate, uh, you know, coming of the kingdom of God when Jesus himself returns in the flesh. And, um, and so, so that's, again, fasting awakens that in us. And it also exp is an expression of that. Uh, where we fast and we pray yearning for the day when Jesus is going to come back. And again, Anna in Luke two is a, is a, is a picture for us of that. She was one who stood in the temple day and night fasting and praying leading up to the first coming of Jesus. And that's a prophetic picture of the bride of Christ at the end of the age pre preceding Jesus's second coming where we will be like a corporate Anna, where we are fasting and praying, ministering to the Lord, worshiping and preparing the way for uh, the return of Christ. So, um, yeah, fasting expresses and cultivates our, our hunger for Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. Good, good job. MB. Go ahead and have that, those short engagements. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I understand some people want to have the longer ones and that's fine. And Jesus seems to have had quite, quite a long one here too, with us <laughs> a couple thousand years so far. We'll see. Um, all right. Point number four here, fasting gives us faith for ministry and miracles. Fasting gives us faith for ministry and miracles. Um, one of the things fasting does is that it really makes us aware of how weak we are. <laughs> trying to not eat. I mean, we think we have self-control, right? We think we're making our own decisions and doing what we want to or not want to do. But man, when you try to not eat all of a sudden, these, uh, these, <laughs> these cravings and these urgings and you go, Oh my gosh, uh, I'm so weak. I'm so dependent, uh, on, on so many other things, but that weakness and that dependence and that realization of, of our need is part of what, what God uses when we fast in our weakness, God is, is strong. Right. And, uh, and so God uses the weakness, the brokenness that comes uh, as we fast um, to uh, cause faith to increase in our hearts. So in other words, we go, we can't do it on our own God. We need you. We've always needed you, but now fasting, we are, uh, just so tuned and aware to the fact that we desperately need you. We're, we need to lean on you. Uh, nothing happens without your power, without your presence. And it causes us to lean, uh, to put our trust and our faith in God, our dependence on God in a greater way. It stirs faith in us. And um, 
and there's this uh there's this story god I don't even have the reference here i'm not sure why but um there's a story of jesus he's um or, or it's actually Jesus's disciples first. It's the disciples where they're asked to cast a demon out of, I think it's a boy. I can't remember if it's a little boy or a little girl that's having these fits and they, they try to do it and they can't do it. And uh, Jesus, the, they go and get Jesus and he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And then Jesus comes and immediately casts the, the evil spirit out of this kid. And then the disciples pull Jesus to the side and they say, why couldn't we cast out uh, this demon? Oh, I might have it in the next section. That might be why I don't have the reference. But um, they say, why couldn't we cast this demon out? And Jesus said, uh, some only come out by prayer and fasting. Some only come out by prayer and fasting. And so when I read that, I go, OK, so what was the issue? Because the first time Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith. And the second time he said, some only come out by prayer and fasting. So what was the issue? Was it their lack of faith or was it prayer and fasting? And it's actually both because prayer and fasting stirs faith in us and living a lifestyle of prayer and fasting causes us to live in, in, in a measure of faith where we're ready to do what we need to do. And so I believe Jesus was fasting and praying as a lifestyle. And so when he came to encounter this demon, he had the faith, even in his humanity, to, to cast the demon out, whereas the disciples weren't. They were not walking in uh, the, same, the same level of faith, I believe, because partially, at least, because they weren't praying and fasting. They weren't, um, they weren't doing that regularly. So prayer and fasting stirs up our faith. And we will see an increase in supernatural activity as we as we enter into fasting. I believe miracles, dreams, healings, um, you know, hearing God's voice, the gifts of the spirit, prophetic activity, all these things are going to are going to increase uh, through, through prayer and fasting. Uh, God's going to pour out his spirit in a in a profound way. Um, here's. Here's a quote from Derek Prince. This is his book uh, from his book, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting from back in 1973. Originally, he said, today, God's spirit is being poured out in a measure. But as yet, we only see a small fraction of the total outpouring the Bible clearly predicts. God is wanting for us to meet his requirements. It will take united prayer and fasting to precipitate the final fullness of the latter rain. So God's pouring out his spirit, but he longs to pour it out more, but it will take united prayer and fasting. And I agree with Derek Prince here. And, and I agree with him because he's reflecting on Joel 2 and Acts 2 and the promise in those scriptures. I'm sure a lot of this is not new to you guys, but I hope it's, it's just encouraging and, uh, and, and uh, helping you re re remember some things and press into some things. But Joel 2, Acts 2 is Joel's prophetic promise for an outpouring of the Spirit of God for revival, if you wanted to summarize it that way. Uh, but it's a call to uh, united prayer, fasting, and humility. And so in the book of Acts, when the church is gathered in the upper room and for 10 days, which is great, Jonathan, right? For 10 days, and they're praying in unity. God pours out his spirit, tongues of fire, speaking in tongues, uh, bold gospel preaching, 2,000, thousands of people get saved. Uh, revival breaks out in Jerusalem. The church is born. Peter stands up and he says, what you're seeing is from Joel 2, Acts 2, verse 16. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he goes on, you guys know this, there's going to be signs, wonders, visions, dreams. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, the point is, it happened for a reason. Peter was explaining what was going on. He's saying, we prayed, and they probably fasted. Uh, and he's saying, we did Joel 2, and then we got an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe if we will follow that Joel 2 pattern of fasting and prayer, then we're going to see uh, an incredible outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit 
more and more and more. Uh, but it's it's conditional, right? Like it's like Second Chronicles seven fourteen, which people quote all the time. If if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. So there is an if then. There is a condition to some of these things. I mean, Joel's prophetic word was was that the people had to turn. They had to humble themselves, right? They had to gather together if they wanted to see uh, the promised outpouring. And so there is an invitation, I believe, from the Holy Spirit to see a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit, revival, awakening, supernatural activity, power in the church, the advancement of the gospel, a great harvest of souls. And I believe we've got to throw fasting in the mix of ingredients, so to speak, uh, in order to pre- press into that. Uh, prayer, vital. Uh, adding fasting is like, you know, another key uh, to to all of this, another important piece to the puzzle. And uh, and I want to encourage us to, to press into that. So faith, excuse me, fasting gives us faith uh, for ministry, and miracles. And, uh, and I, I've specifically, I know Lou Ingalls talked about this before too, but specifically, uh, it really releases dreams. It seems like dreams and, uh, tend to uptick, uh, when you, when you enter in times of fasting, prophetic dreams from God. All right, here we go. Point number five, uh, quick review first. Number one, fasting is, is normal Christianity. Facts, fasting accesses what Jesus died to give. Fasting expresses and cultivates hunger for Jesus. Fasting gives us faith for ministry and miracles. Number five, fasting is an act of spiritual warfare. Fasting is an act of spiritual warfare. There's a battle raging, and it's easy to forget that uh, that the enemy hates us, <laughs> that demons hate us, that uh, the enemy especially hates praying p- believers. <laughs> prophetic intercessors, um, prophetic worshipers um, who are a direct assault to the kingdom of darkness. And so we are in a battle. You guys are in a battle. Doing global prayer room is a battle. It's an act of, it's an act of spiritual warfare. You are, and you don't have to be rebuking anything or casting anything out or calling out any spirits of anything in order for it to be spiritual warfare. You talking to Jesus, you singing to Jesus, you praying, um, interacting with him, gathering others together, asking the Lord for revival, uh, is an act of, is an act of spiritual warfare. Um, and you know, Ephesians fit Ephesians six, Paul's right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, but we do wrestle, right? We, I think it was Rick Joyner said, we cast out demons, but we wrestle against principalities and powers. So individuals, you know, demons sometimes need to be cast out. Um, But in prayer, we are wrestling, right? There's a wrestle. There's a battle that takes place. We don't always totally understand it. I don't understand it all. Uh, But I know it's a reality. There's angels and demons uh, shifting and, and warring and raging and things are happening in the spirit realm. Sometimes we get glimpses of it or we see the manifestation of it in the earth. uh, And sometimes we don't. But um, I think the the one cool story here to show specifically how fasting is related to this is is in Daniel, Daniel, you know, nine and ten, where Daniel receives a you know chapter nine he receives a word from the Lord, um. And he, he starts fasting and praying. Daniel 9, 3 says, I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, pleas for mercy with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. Daniel 10, you kind of have the have have a repeat. He um gets a word from gets a you know word from the Lord and begins fasting and praying. And specifically in chapter 10, Daniel enters into this 21-day fast. And um uh, and it's not until day 21 that he has any indication of what's going on because of this fast. And that's a, that's a great practical point, by the way, is a lot of times the breakthrough for fasting happens after you're fasting. I've experienced this, that if I take a couple of days and fast, 
a lot of, sometimes not always, but sometimes the days of fasting feel pretty hard. <laughs> sometimes miserable, sometimes uncomfortable. Sometimes I don't feel like a sense of God's presence or hear anything. But if I, a few days or a week or so after that, all of a sudden I'll, I'll, you know, be having encounters or hearing God's voice, or there'll be something prophetic that happens or, you know, Lord moves some way in our lives. And, and, and I, I've learned over the years to connect the dots and go, Oh, okay. <laughs> Remember we were doing this, this fasting room, we were praying for this thing. And in the moment it feels like nothing, but, uh, but then you look back and you go, okay, the breakthrough sometimes comes after the fast or at the very end of the fast. And so just because you don't feel something in the middle of fasting doesn't mean that it's not working. Uh, it, it's, it's still working. Uh, and, and many times the uncomfortableness is part of how it, it is working. So, uh, that's just a little, uh, little side note there, but so Daniel enters into this 21 day fast and on the 21st day, I love this in verses 12 and 13, this angel comes and speaks to him and says, fear not Daniel for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard, and I've come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So this is incredible. He says, you know, uh, from, from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself, in other words, to fast, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So Daniel starts fasting and praying the angels released in heaven, but he's on the earth and has no idea what's going on, but things are happening in the spirit takes three weeks. Finally, there's, there's this battle going on. Daniel's clueless down here on the earth, <laughs> you know, probably hungry and praying and mourning and longing. And there's this war raging between the prince of the kingdom of Persia, a regional demonic stronghold and this angel and then michael comes into the picture and they're warring and raging in heaven and finally on the 21st day there's a breakthrough and uh and this angel is able to, to come and, and be released to daniel and we have no idea guys as we're fasting and praying uh as you guys are doing these hours in the global family prayer room as you're seeking the lord we have no idea sometimes what is going on but I pray that the 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 word of God would encourage us and that we would be able to to pause sometimes and and go wait a second something's happening in the spirit right now things are moving things are shifting God hears me angels and demons are moving light is invading darkness and and in due time things will be released into the earth things will be manifested onto onto the earth we are in a battle raging with fasting and prayer um but i want to encourage you even when you don't see it to just stay steady in it and stay faithful in it and just because you don't see it doesn't mean uh nothing's happening so yeah i'm i'm running out of time here but i got through all five which is awesome and uh yeah just just one more time, fasting regularly is normal Christianity. Fasting accesses what Jesus died to give. Fasting expresses and cultivates hunger for Jesus. Fasting increases our faith for ministry and miracles. And fasting is an act of, of spiritual warfare. So I just want to encourage you guys, keep praying and 